Hello and welcome to the Accounting Marketing Doesn't Suck podcast. You may notice that I am not your normal host of this podcast, and that's because today's episode is a special one. Today marks the 50th episode of the Accounting Marketing Doesn't Suck podcast, and so to celebrate, we're going to do a little role reversal and we're going to put our host, Hugh Duffy, in the hot seat. So let me briefly introduce myself. I'm Callie Bransfort, and I am the Content Marketing Manager at Build Your Firm. And a little over a year ago, Hugh and I, along with some team members here at Build Your Firm, concocted the idea to start this podcast. Since Build Your Firm was founded over 16 years ago, we've worked with accounting professionals from so many different walks of life. And we've heard so many amazing and unique stories of them not just building practices that were successful, but ones that they really, truly love to own. And we knew these stories would be inspiring and enlightening to so many other accountants, which is how this podcast has grown. Over the past 50 episodes, Hugh has talked to so many different professionals doing all very different and very unique things in this space. And after each episode, he's always really excited to share with us our team here at Build Your Firm, something new that he heard about, a takeaway that he learned, or just something inspiring that he got from a guest. And so it only made sense for our 50th episode to turn the tables and sit down with Hugh to talk about these big takeaways and lessons. Now, for those of you who don't know a lot about our host, since he's usually not the one doing a lot of talking, let me just start with a brief introduction. Hugh Duffy is the co-founder and CMO of Build Your Firm a marketing company exclusively for the accounting industry. He received his MBA at the University of Rochester in marketing and his Bachelor of Science at Maryland in finance. He has more than 30 years of marketing experience and is considered a marketing coach for accountants, helping them to grow practices that they want to run, develop successful niches, and ultimately impact their overall lives. In his spare time, he was an avid golfer, diehard Maryland Terps fan, and he also plays competitive paddleboard. And with that introduction, Hugh, welcome to your own podcast. Thank you. I'm <laughs> looking forward to it, Callie. This will be interesting to sort of flip the tables on you, but I think that there'll be some good insights that'll come out of it. Yeah. Okay, so like I said, this is our 50th episode. It's been almost a year since we launched it. What does it feel like to hit the 50 mark? Well, much to my surprise, this podcast is getting traction. The audience is building each and every week, each and every month, and we've had some phenomenal guests. I've been surprised at the guests we've been able to attract. The Accounting Marketing Doesn't Suck podcast has been fun. It's pushed me into a bunch of different ways to meet so many talented and gifted people within our industry, and it has forced me to learn topics well outside of my marketing comfort zone. So I could ask the right questions, challenge people, and uh, if they really weren't giving me the answers or insights I thought our audience needed, I was willing to push them. Some of the takeaways that I've had so far um, that I think our audience could identify with is uh, the pace of change. And it's not only in the accounting industry, but it's also within the general business marketplace. The pace of change continues to increase. The life cycles get faster and faster. With the advent of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and how the general marketplace is accelerating. And the expectation on us here in the U.S. marketplace continues uh, to, uh, to increase. Uh, and as a result, in turn, what's going to happen is productivity will increase and error rates will reduce. The other things that... Uh, it kind of surprised me. It took a little bit more work to get prepped. Uh, things like cryptocurrency, things like cannabis, uh, which is kind of like the wild, wild west. But uh, it's been fun, and uh, it, it's fascinating learning more and more about the industry and some of the neat things going on within our industry. Yeah. Well, and you've been working in this industry for a long time, yeah. but I'm sure you've heard some interesting things interviewing these people. What has shocked you the most? Well, there's a couple that have stopped me and stopped me on my tracks. The one, uh, as I was interviewing Angie Grism with the Rainmaker Companies, and she made a comment in there. And again, I'll preface it by saying that my background is marketing. I worked in industries and for companies were marketing driven. So I always had an expectation that marketing was basically the end all be all of building a business, a successful business. Uh, and she made the comment to me that in this industry, marketing doesn't have a seat at the partner table, uh, which really surprised me. It caused me to step back and say, really? 
is it right? Is she wrong? Uh, and it's kind of a mixed bag. She does have insight in that at some of the large firms, some of the top 100 firms, marketing does not have a seat at the table. But I think that tide is slowly uh, and surely starting to change. I think more and more as some of the marketing professionals and non-CPA professionals within some of the top 100, top 200 firms demonstrate their worth, their capabilities, their insight, their expertise. Uh, I think the industry is starting to change, but some people do work within a firm that does not allow marketing to have a seat at the partner table. So that stopped me in my tracks uh, and made me hesitate and think twice and, and I hope that changes holistically. The second one that happened was an interview I was having with Paul Niefer. Now Paul has a phenomenal niche in Pharma County. He's out in the Northwest. Um, he's today he's with Clifton, Larson and Allen. And uh, I used to read his blog, which was very well constructed, um, clearly demonstrated his expertise, his knowledge of the importance of content marketing and blogging. Uh, and we're talking and I couldn't, you know, I, I've been kind of glancing at his blog for years and all of a sudden, you know, I reached out to him after we launched this and asked him would he be kind enough to talk to our group and he was willing we're talking and I asked him one of the questions about why he ultimately sold his practice as he continues to practice to Clifton Larson and Allen and did that change his life and he explained to me that despite the phenomenal growth that was going on within his firm that the reason he ultimately decided to sell and merge with Clifton and Larson Allen is that one day, you know, as their business was growing, the pain was on each of the three partners, that one of the partners decided to go down to the basement and hung himself. And I was like, oh, uh, 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 I really wasn't expecting <laughs> that in the middle of a podcast interview, but uh, he laid it out there, proceeded like it was no big deal, and I quickly pivoted the topic. So uh, those were two shocks that I had in the course of the series. Yeah. And, and I think that that's the interesting thing about these interviews is that you don't always know exactly what you're getting into. I mean, we research these guests ahead of time. We know who we're going to talk to, but you don't always know where the conversations will go. And I think that's what's been really great about the, the conversations that you've been having. Yeah, it's been fun. Yeah. Uh, so what are some of the big insights that some guests have shared that you think are going to be changing the accounting industry? Yeah, and these are just a couple of examples, but I've, I've had some phenomenal guests, some phenomenal people that have shared some insights in a very compelling fashion. The first one that comes to mind, and I'll, I'll just share three of them. First one is Michelle Golden, who was very, very articulate uh, as it relates to pricing in advance. Pricing in advance, that is, and how most accounting firms misunderstand the concept uh, and confuse it and conflate it with fixed fees and how she's really guiding top 100 CPA firms out of hourly billing into pricing in advance. And her reasons were that technology is automating many of the functions that today we take for granted within the industry, whether or not it's audit, whether or not it's tax prep, whether or not it's bookkeeping. So changing the pricing model is inevitable. You know, as technology is going to take over some of these functions, whether it's audit, tax prep, or bookkeeping, the business model of charging by the hour, if something's going to shrink in time, suppose it, it becomes you know 50% of the time it takes to produce a particular service, that's not a very good business model if some of the bigger firms are charging by the hour. In other words, as you get as you become more efficient, all of a sudden you can consume or charge less than half that. So that was one thing that I thought she was very, very good at illustrating the benefits and where the industry is going and, and making that change within top 100 firms. I think we all recognize and hate you know, the hourly billing model, but many of the big firms have been resistant to make that change. She also was very eloquent about going into combating things like scope creep and really illustrated and opened my eyes to cross-selling opportunities that exist once you start to operate in a pricing in advance um, model. The other example, and she did a really good job of providing an example, and one of the things that I brought to her is that 
you know, there's always a couple type of engagements that you can't possibly price in advance. And she basically said, that's bogus. That's an excuse. And the example she gave me is if an insurance company can price in advance insurance to cover disasters, whether it's a fire, whether it's a flood, a hurricane, or a fire, if they can project and they can encompass and they can predict what the likelihood of that outcome is, why can't you project and estimate what it's going to cost to deliver a service that a large CPA firm has done hundreds or thousands of times? And it's not that difficult to do it, and it's just a cop-out. So um, I, I, I would highly encourage our listeners that are thinking about it, even though, even though you might be in a large firm, uh, that episode uh, in talking about pricing in advance. The second one that I thought was very interesting was our first one. Our first episode was Scott Zara, and he's clearly changing the way accountants consume and obtain CPE within the industry of, uh, of accounting by being able to provide people the ability to get CPE for free. The third one that I thought was interesting was improving the customer experience. And there were two people we interviewed on two totally different episodes that kind of went through how their firms have changed um, the whole way that they approach customer service. And the way I would illustrate it is if you go back to the days when the manufacturing industry was starting to do Six Sigma um, they basically started to do it throughout the manufacturing industry to be able to improve the quality of the products that were being manufactured. Well, Mitch Reno at Raymond and Betsy Story Bono at Concan and Miller both really opened my eyes to using net promoter scores holistically within their firms to be able to deliver a more consistent product by measuring customer satisfaction rates to push it down down to the office level, down to the individual employee, so that they can measure people's ability to deliver a high quality product consistently, uh, and ultimately to improve customer satisfaction rates. And that's really what it gets down to. And it's seldom done, but both of those uh, executives have done a phenomenal job of measuring it, pushing it down into the organization to deliver and improve customer satisfaction rates. So those were some pretty big eye-opening moments for me in this process. Yeah, I think it's been interesting just um, sort of these people thinking, they kind of have to think out of the box with some of the stuff that they're doing, which sort of makes me wonder, what are some of the other examples of creativity that you heard about or that surprised you when you were interviewing some of these guests? Absolutely. There were a couple that really stood out. I mean, it's not to say that, you know, it's not pervasive in our industry, but the two that really stood out for me, one was Sarah Sorelli, uh, back in the days when she was at Witham, uh, and it's priceless. And I'd encourage our listeners to pull up the two videos that she did when she was there. Um, and, and they're on YouTube. The one, and if you could imagine trying to motivate a bunch of, you know, accountants within a, a large firm like Witham, that they should basically do some mock videos to tunes. And the first was Black Eyed Peas, I've Got a Feeling. The second was Party Rock Anthem, The Dancing Accountants. They basically videoed both of these. And, you know, if you watch them, it changed your attitude of with them, changed your attitude of accounting as an industry and generated a lot of free PR for the firm and a lot of business. The other one was Eric Myshak, you know, back in the days when he was at Free Max. Today he's at Beach Fleischman, but one of the concepts and one of the ideas that Eric had is he wanted to integrate into a billboard advertisement, a Twitter promotion. So again, it was electronic, it was simultaneous, but he wanted to merge together the power of Twitter as a medium and a billboard off the highway to deliver a promotion back in the days when he was at Freed Maxic, and it was highly successful. Those are two amazing creative approaches to really advertising that I would say it's really hard to get the bang that they got for the buck, for the idea. And I give them both credit for selling the idea internally within a large firm, uh, which 
is really out of the box. It's very unconventional. And it, it might be a neat, crazy idea, but for it to actually deliver amazing business results, which in both cases it did, uh, is really, really creative in my opinion. And those are two that really stand out to me. All right, my next question is, what is the most out-of-the-box skill set that you experience talking to these different guests? Oh, that's a great question. You know, if I think about it, it's it's something I didn't know that existed. It's, it's called the art of storytelling. Uh, it's something that really impressed me. And, you know, I know within the legal industry, storytelling is important for obvious reasons when you're presenting a story and a compelling story to a jury. But in the accounting industry, it's probably not one of the skills that's highly valued. But uh, Tracy Cigar opened my eyes. And what she does outside with her personal life is she does competitive storytelling. And I was like, what is competitive storytelling? I don't get it. And what she does is she will get in a competition in a theater with hundreds of total strangers and tell a story. And the people that obviously have the best stories win. Um, so she is a award-winning storyteller. And she basically gotten down a process to get total strangers to listen. It gets so quiet. Emotionally, they connect with her. You could hear a pin drop in a theater. And really what she's trying to do is go through the fundamental building blocks and steps to get somebody to listen to your story in a compelling and uh, an emotional way. And uh, she's very gifted at it. And it's a transferable, um, it's a transferable skill that I think if most CPA business owners or partners could learn the effectiveness of this process to sell, to connect with prospects, um, to engage with their clients, whether it's over the phone. I think it's a very transferable business skill that should be fundamental to our industry. And uh, I, I found it fascinating. So it was something I'd never heard of. I never heard of competitive storytelling. Um, it would be uh, very difficult to do. You know, it's a, it's a topic that you're talking about something in front of total strangers and trying to do it in a dynamic, compelling, and motivating way. Uh, and doing it in a, in a competitive environment. And uh, I thought it was fascinating. But I, I mention it because it, it's so unique, it's so different. But if our industry could learn it as a way to sell their services, I think it would move, um, move the needle in a big way. All right, shifting topics just a little, we do know that a good majority of our audience are single owner CPA firms. So if you had to pick what episode or episodes that you think every single owner CPA should listen to from our first 50 episodes, which ones would you pick? Interesting. Well, I'd, I'd probably force them to listen to all of them. <laughs> but uh, now all kidding, kidding aside, uh, required listening. I'd probably go back to two come to mind. And I'll explain why. The first is from Gail Crosley. And she basically went through the fundamentals of having a niche or a specialty within your practice. And the business benefits associated with doing that and doing it well. Uh, she's been doing it for a long time within our industry. Before that, she did it in some other technology industries. Uh, and I thought it was very well done and very persuasive. The other one that comes to mind is Bill Carlino. Um, and he gave some insights in the mergers and acquisitions area uh, as it relates to, you know, when it comes time to sell at some point in time, whether it's 10, 20, 30 years down the road from now. Uh, but some of the uh, deal killers to uh, selling your practice, some of the things to think within your practice you should have to maximize the value. Um, some of the things that buyers are attracted to what they want, what they're looking for. And, and I say that because what you do is you plan these or incorporate these elements into your practice long before it becomes time to sell the practice. It's kind of like staging a house. There's things that, colors that you paint a room, additions that you make, whether or not you can get your money out of it when it comes time to sell the house. 
It's the same way with a business practice. There are certain elements that you want to have as part of your accounting practice that a buyer is going to be willing to pay more money for or is going to be more interested in buying that type of practice than what the practice may exist as of today. So uh, I thought Bill Carlino's insights were uh, probably required reading for uh, anyone that owns their own practice as well. Yeah. And in some of the conversations that you've had, I mean, we've talked to people on all spectrums and all sorts of niches running all different kinds of practices. What areas surprised you the most? It's, it's interesting. The, uh, and it's probably one of the fastest growing areas as well, but the cannabis area to me was a hot mess. And <laughs> everything from, you know, it, it's rapidly growing, but it's also, you know, it's complicated because, um, you know, the rules vary on a state-by-state -state basis, sometimes city-by-city -city basis, but nothing is standardized. Nothing is easy in the cannabis space. There are no, you know, there's no QuickBooks online. There's no standard chart of accounts. There's a risk of audit at all times from various angles. There's no gap accounting rules. They have this stupid thing called seed to sale. Uh, there's even banking. Everything from payroll to banking to how you pay for things is complicated. You know, it's a cash-based business, which nobody is these days. Um, and you can't even deduct ordinary business expenses. So that's the first one that comes to mind. Um, there were a couple other surprises that kind of caught me um, you know, by surprise. Not that I'm exposed to these, but another one was uh, the resistance in our industry to embrace cryptocurrency. And we all read about it. We're familiar with it. We know it's coming. Um, and yet, you know, leaders like J.P. Morgan Chase and Facebook, they're all in. Yet our industry has kind of done a Heisman and kind of been slow to embrace this technology, this form of payment, uh, and some of the archaic rules that still surround, you know, people that are using it as uh, a currency. And, and I say currency because I view it more as a currency and I don't view it as really an investment. So, you know, those those were two things that, that stood out as I got closer and closer to it. And two of those that you talked about were sort of, you know, they were niches that these people operated within. And, and a lot of the guests that we talked to on this podcast operate a niche. And niche is nothing new to you. You've worked with accountants practicing in niches for a long time. You've coached your, your clients to develop niches. But um, there's always something to learn. So what's something that you have learned from interviewing this really wide variety of niches? Yeah, it's it's been enlightening and it's also been fascinating. Uh, I'm a big advocate of developing a niche. I always have been. I've been explaining this now since we started. Uh, and really what I'm trying to do is encourage accountants not to become a jack of all trades. Um, and, and while... You know, they're different. Here are some of the themes that I noticed in trying to avoid being a jack of all trades. By having a successful or developing a successful niche, what happens is there's a higher level of satisfaction and passion for what they do. Their staff actually enjoys working more in the office. Uh, and there's a higher level of expertise that each staff member as well as the owner starts to enjoy. The owner starts to gradually enjoy what they do as well. And it's not easy to be a jack of all trades. Um, it also takes longer than most people realize. Um, Gail Croslick clearly illustrated that it typically takes three or more years to develop a niche. And if you don't commit to it, it might take longer than that. And once the niche becomes established, your geographic marketing area starts to expand. In other words, location becomes less relevant. The other things that kind of caught my attention um, is that education uh, and educating your client becomes an important part. And this can be fun as well. Um, there, was, there was a couple of people that we interviewed that had a craft beer niche. So they explained things like teaching at the guild within their state and how to start their craft beer business or the craft beverage business. That that was a fundamental element of growing a niche within their particular state. Another one that was interesting, um, and this was a forensic accountant that's gone on to develop a very attractive niche within a large metropolitan market, 
One of the things he's done is penetrated colleges and universities, or in his case, what he's trying to do is reach people before they start to practice their trade. And in his case, he actually teaches a, and provides a mock trial within law schools. So what he's really doing is teaching lawyers before they, you know, uh, become, you know, bar certified, um, how to approach a trial and actually produces and provides a mock trial for a couple law firms, actually, excuse me, law schools. So what he does is effectively teaches and introduces his firm and who he is before they go off and hang out their own shingle. So it's a great feeder system for him, you know, down the road, you know, 5, 10, 20 years down the road, because they've met him when they went to law school. Uh, so that's a nice tactic that he's integrated into his marketing program that's served him well over, you know, decades. Another one is benchmarking and coaching. It becomes integral to becoming a trusted advisor or an expert in a partic particular niche. Uh, and it, uh, it just it becomes fun, uh, it becomes an expectation, and it becomes something you can charge extra money for. Another one that came together as I interviewed a lot of these people is speaking engagements become critical to your marketing and demonstrating your capabilities. It becomes kind of something you can do in your sleep. There's three other small things that... I noticed with these niches, and, and we did interview a lot of different people. One is the content marketing becomes more meaningful and more relevant. In other words, as you start to become an expert in a certain service or in a particular industry, you start to write about the same topics and you understand your target audience better. And as a result, it's easier to execute marketing against your niche. Next of which is coaching becomes a higher level and a higher fee paying service. And last of which is networking as you become a niche expert becomes more natural. You're going to trade shows or you're meeting with uh, continuing education groups. It could be study clubs, all different types of practitioners. And it becomes more natural. It, it's not as contrived. It's not as broad. And the easiest way to explain it is... If you go to a trade show that is 20 or 30,000 people and the attendees are all over the map in different industries, it kind of becomes fake and contrived to network with those people. Whereas if it's your expertise and it's focused on one topic or on one industry and you know it better than they do, it becomes natural and it becomes fun. It becomes more enjoyable. Yeah, and I think it's so interesting that you say it becomes fun for them. So I guess my next question going off of that is, what are some examples you have of accountants that are enjoying their niches more than a generalist practitioner might? Yeah, it's. I guess I'd say it, it, part of it is it becomes human nature to become great at de delivering a particular service and being recognized as an expert at something rather than trying to be a jack-of-all-trades. Being good at servicing all types of accounts of business is tough. Quite frankly, it's impossible. Most lawyers or doctors would never, ever try to service and provide all types of law or all types of medical services, and yet many CPAs try to do just that. The tax code is over 60,000 pages long, and to service everyone from cannabis to crypto to cybersecurity is impossible. So why do you do it? So some of the examples that I remember vividly of niche practitioners that are really starting to enjoy what they do. Jimmy Bell was one, and he has a niche with veterinarians. Another was Eric Killian, uh, who has a niche with fitness centers. Another one was Mariel Diaz uh, with jewelers. She's a second-generation jeweler. She is a gemologist. She understands the industry. She grew up in it. But at the same time, she happens to be a CPA and she's willing to go to shows and demonstrate her capabilities and her expertise within that particular industry. And that's all she works with. Baz and Michael was another in his comfort level with dentists. Paul Nefer I talked about earlier. 
uh, and, and what he does within the farming and agricultural industry. He's a fourth generation farmer. He owns a farm himself. He writes an amazing blog and 40% of his time is spent on outreach, whether it's speaking, whether or not it's continuing education, whether or not it's, uh, you know, just teaching people in general and it becomes a huge referral network for him. Another one was Steve Piazic, uh, who works with professional athletes. Just to, Although he wasn't that open in terms of talking about who his clients were because he wanted to make that confidential, you could clearly tell you know, when the NFL or the uh, Major League Baseball reaches out to him to teach a bunch of uh, rookies, uh, or he enjoys watching drafts or going to some of the championship sporting events, how, how good he is at it and how he enjoys being one of the best amongst professional athletes. Another one was Matt Hedrick. Um, Matt owns a restaurant. He also happens to be a CPA and uh, it does a phenomenal job within the culinary um, uh, culinary and restaurants and hospitality depending on, uh, on how you want to define it, but there's, there's a genuine sense of fulfillment that comes from being an industry expert. And I think if you listen to these uh, episodes, I think you clearly hear it, whether or not it's going to craft beer shows, whether or not it's going to designer industry shows, uh, like Peter Lang does down in High Point, North Carolina. There's, there's nothing wrong with drinking your own Kool-Aid, enjoying what you do, and making more money in the process. Yeah, definitely. And I think that I think that when we first started this this podcast, we knew there were going to be so many interesting conversations to have. There were so many interesting niches out there to talk to. Um, and we knew that people would find it interesting and insightful, but we weren't totally sure exactly what we were getting into. There's not a ton of podcasts in our um, industry, and so we were sort of jumping in a little bit blind. So I'm curious, after these 50 episodes we've done, what feedback have you received about the podcast? Well, I have been surprised. I've been, I've been surprised by the number of episodes that many accountants have listened to. Uh, not just one or two, uh, but, you know, I've, I've been surprised. Some, some folks that have very successful practices have told me I've, I've listened to all but the last two or three, and I'm surprised at it. Uh, I've received some blind emails from people I didn't know, uh, and that's how they became guests on the show. And I would encourage you, if you have a particular niche or expertise that you feel you belong on this show, reach out to me. My email uh, is hugh at buildyourfirm.com. It's H-U-G-H at buildyourfirm.com. I'm open to your criticisms. I'm open to your ideas. If there's a topic or pain point that you have, I'm open to hear that as well and hear you out. Um, but at the same time, I've been very surprised at how people have been willing uh, to show up on this podcast. Influencers, technology experts, top 100 marketers, Partners who are making millions of dollars and have enormous demands on their schedules but have been willing to talk to us and share their insights, uh, their pain points, um, what they do to grow their niche, what they do to become superior, what they do to, uh, you know, to grow the book of business that they have. It's been fun. It's been neat. I, you know, Some of my biggest concerns when we first got into this, and, and Callie, you, know, you and Liz pushed me over the course of eight or nine months to do this and I hummed and I hawed and I probably similar to probably the, the apprehension that a lot of people have about developing an inch in their practice I didn't know if there was enough substance there I didn't know if there was enough sustainability I didn't know whether or not there'd be enough people willing to come on and share their stories and whether or not it build an audience and it'd be interesting uh, I didn't want to do something for two or three months and it petered out. Uh, we all get tired of that. Fortunately, this hasn't been the case. It's been fun. So uh, if there's folks out there that want to participate and they feel they deserve to be on the show, I'm more than op open to, to hearing your ideas and reach out to me uh, and give you a shot at it. But uh, it's been fun. Um, I've enjoyed it. The You know, it's... Uh, it's really pushed me to meet a bunch of people I normally wouldn't have met. And, uh, you know, I, most of the trade shows I go to uh, are about learning marketing and, and developing my craft. They're not as, as often about 
going to a, an accounting trade show. But it has been fun. It is building. Uh, I enjoy it, and I'd love to hear from our listeners if they're out there and they, they would like to be on the show. Well, Hugh, congratulations on 50 episodes. I think that um, I know we have some really good stuff coming up. So yeah. I look forward to the next 50 and what the future holds for this podcast. Well, thanks, Callie. It's been fun. And uh, I look forward to hearing from each of you out there, too.